Hello, divers. Welcome once more to the one, the only, except for all the others with the same stupid title, mm. the Deep Dive Podcast. This is where each episode we strive to find something, anything to watch on streaming media. I'm Tom Feeney, writer for Wangshot Movie Magazine, and once again joining me here in Studio D is my co-host, the magnificent Mandalorian. Hello, Manda. Hello, sir. I am so happy to be back. We took a little break there for a little for a few weeks. Yeah. Um, but you know, summer's winding down, and I figured, well, I've already committed, so I have to be here. Wow. Okay. Well. <laughs> How does that sound? No. So are you quiet quitting this? Is that what you're doing? I'm just about to act my wage. Actually. Oh, there oh. we go. The great resignation. And to be fair, I don't get paid anything for this. So really? I expect nothing. Wow. You don't get paid? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to write somebody about oh, that one. Oh, man. But oh. yeah, we're back and we uh, have got a great episode and I'm super excited because it's not super hot up here, which is nice. Yeah, I, you know, it, it does get that way sometimes, but... Because, you know, heat and rising and all yeah, that. Yeah, because we're, you know, we're in the, the studio is like three floors up and it's yeah. a, and the AC doesn't really reach, <laughs> which no, is not doesn't. good. But, you know, we're, we're okay. We got to keep the fans off because of the sound, but I think we're, we'll, be, we'll be all right. We keep our fans off to turn our fans on. Get it? Because people who listen to us are kind of like our fans and then we're giving them new content and... I don't get it. Right, anyway, uh, this week is part one of a special two-part episode. Yes. yes. We are kind of ramping up for our annual Halloween Horror Month, starting, of course, in October. Yes. But we couldn't wait until then to couldn't. start no, to start talking about our favorite <laughs> frightening films. Because, I mean, if you think about it, Halloween just keeps, you know, like, like, like the Christmas creep. Right. Mm. They start putting out Christmas, you know, decorations early. They're starting to do the same thing with Halloween now. We'll call it the Halloween shuffle. The Halloween shuffle. Exactly. So basically you can now find Halloween stuff right now. Right. So of August. you've got spirit Halloween stores. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're invading all the abandoned Toys R Us's and, <laughs> and staples uh, as we speak. And, you know, Party City, Party City, Target, Walmart, everywhere. Michael's. They have so many cool they crafts. Do. Oh. Uh, Home Depot's got stuff. Lowe's has got stuff. Yep. Uh, it's great. So they've all got it. Now, here's something interesting. Speaking of Spirit Halloween, hmm. there's a movie. On October 11th. Yes. Spirit Halloween, the movie will be unleashed on video on demand. That's right. <laughs> This is a thing. This is a real, actual thing. And it stars Christopher Lloyd. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And it looks kind of goofy. It looks kind of like they're trying to go for a Stranger Things vibe where uh, a bunch of kids decide to spend Halloween night inside a, oh, no. a spirit Halloween store. And the animatronics and all that, they come to life. Course, and Just like Chucky's. Yeah, like a Chucky or a Five Nights at Freddy's or you right. know something like that but it looks kind of goofy and silly and right. fun i hope it is i mean i uh, love campy stuff yeah and it looks you know? very campy uh so we'll have to see but I, I i think you and i should review it yes uh for one of the october episodes oh yes absolutely because i'm really curious about this but here's the thing you know and i have you know i've done shows about this uh in the past that you know ho hollywood does not want to let it anything go this is so true. Yeah. You know, if there's a trend or a successful franchise, Hollywood's going to try to copy it. They're going to do something with it. So yep. this has already led, the Spirit Halloween movie, <laughs> has already led to some other movies being produced that are based on chain stores. Oh, man. There's got to be a blockbuster one. I would think so because it's a blockbuster video. Right. But here are some potential. <laughs> potential ones. Potential ones. I've got uh, The Magnificent 7-Eleven. Papa John Wick, The Wolf of Walmart. Oh, man. There you go. Bed Bath and Beyond Thunderdome. <laughs> this one I'm looking forward to. Quiznos Ferratu. Oh. TGI Friday the 13th. Yes. Nine to five, guys. <laughs> and of course, Popeyes. Now. No, uh, no. So look for those oh. or not. And uh, at that's some why point, we're never getting sponsored. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. 
But if you wanted to, you could. I mean, yeah. Just send us an email. It's deep dive podcast at gmail.com. Yes. More details to follow. Stay yes. tuned. Yes. But we are doing part one yes. of our end of summer spectacular yes. or splash tacular or whatever you want to call it. Ooh. And so it's going to be end of summer slashers. And next week will be end of summer splashers. Yes, yeah, splashers. Now that that does sound like some sort of Starbucks drink. But it's not. Nope. 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 We will not charge you to listen to our podcast. No, no. I mean, we could. Yeah, but then <laughs> we'd have fewer listeners than we already do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so part one is going to be the spooky slasher, you know, films that we love doing. And then our next second part of the episode will be all about the ocean. Because who loves summer without loving the ocean? You, you can't have one without the other. Yes, although I have noticed that there are two kinds of people in this world. People mm. who like the ocean. Yes. And people who would prefer to swim in pools. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I'm a pool person. Are you? I do not like the ocean because it is filled with fish poop. Well, to and be other fair, things. to be fair, is it that you don't like the ocean or you don't like the beach because it has sand? That too. Okay. All right. I'm very Anakin Skywalker when it comes to sand. Thalassophobic then. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Okay. Basically. So there you there you have it. But fair. But that, so stay tuned after this episode. We'll, we'll have part two up and I know that everyone listening is just going to love it. Because they are. I already love it and mm -hmm. it was my idea it was it was yes. like the only idea that tom's ever let me bring that's absolutely <laughs> possibly true and if you heard that that was not me no um i have not eaten dinner yet didn't you get your daughter a motorcycle motorcycle though for her oh, 16th birthday i did yeah. i did and uh if you want to donate to the medical bills um <laughs> no no it was she has wheels. her permit but she's not driving yet no we're all very look scared. out world <laughs> yeah, we're terrified uh, <sighs> all right, so end of summer slashers. slashers. Would you care Ooh, to go first? I would. Thank all you. Right, all right. So this, my first pick is interesting because it is one of those foreign films that, of course, was released in the States. But like other films, it it's just radically different. Mm. Um, right down to the movie poster. Um, now, I'm sure you're aware, but the 60s, well, maybe even like earlier, maybe the 20s and 30s and 40s had those movie posters that were really about narrative storytelling. You know, unlike today's movie posters where they just basically highlight the actors that are in the movie, these posters basically told the story. Mm. And it allowed people to discern whether or not they're going to like the movie by giving them... A scene without words, as it were. Um, the Americanized or American version of this film's poster is way better than the Italian version. Um, but just something to keep in mind. All right. So my movie is entitled, quote, The Girl Who Knew Too Much in Italy mm -hmm. or in the States. It is called The Evil Eye. <laughs> The supernatural powers of the evil eye claim still another victim. Its malevolent enjoyment of tantalizing torture hangs threateningly over John Saxon, Letitia Roman, and Valentina Corteza. Oh, she was always against me! She hated me! Madness. And the maddening aura that destroys reason fills their every breath with the smell of death. Miss Rawson, have you ever seen a murder before? No, no, I've never seen anything like that. Never. Oh, stop playing games, will you, Landini? I don't know what you're trying to do, but I know that you're, you're involved in this. Perhaps Nora has seen the killer. But how do we know that he hasn't seen her? The evil eye like relentless tides reaches out for them. And they defiantly hold ecstasy and horror in their arms and touch lips with terror while the evil eye watches their every kiss and invades their subconscious.
came out in 1963, which, as you know, is sort of definitely not my favorite genre, but it's the burgeoning of the slasher obsessed generations, as it were. Hmm. Right. And then they become adults in the 80s. I, I guess. I don't know. I wasn't alive. Then. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can speak more to that. No comment. <laughs> okay. So let's give a quick breakdown. This movie was directed by Mario Babas, who, Ooh, yes. He, I know that name. He is one of those directors that sadly didn't come to fame and cult status until, you know, posthumously, where people are now speaking about him on levels of like Alfred Hitchcock, which may rile somebody up. But I mean, he his, a lot of his movies now have fallen into that cult classic um, theme, especially because they were presented in uh, sort of lampooned on Mystery Science Theater. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you've made it if you get there. Absolutely. Right. The Weird Al of movies. The we- <laughs> Can't wait to see that new movie. I'm going to oh, watch it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, okay, so quick breakdown. Let's see. A woman named Nora Davis, right? She is played by uh, Leticia Roman, who apparently was a really big deal in the 60s. Model, Italian actress, uh, actress whatever. Um, <laughs> it's one of these things where, like, you could tell it was made in Italy, but like, they for American audiences. So this very highly Italian woman was called Nora Davis whatever Mm. she decides she's going to go to rome and visit her elderly aunt which by the way uh there's no mention of why she just happens to be going there so plot hole she goes there and during the first 20 minutes of the movie the aunt is like croaking she's just like she's out she's gone so back then i suppose it was still the time of house doctor visits so she was expecting the doctor he didn't come around so she's like i'm just gonna go and walk to the hospital in the middle of the night sure what could go wrong yeah except she gets mugged Uh and then like knocked out and she goes unconscious for a certain amount of time when she comes to she sees like this big surly bearded guy in the shadows who is Rem- removing a butcher's knife from the back of a woman. Ooh. Ooh. Right? And Salty. she is freaked out, as you can imagine. Mm. So what does she do? She just turns around and runs, and she happens at a hospital because that's where she was going anyways. They, of course, think she's delusional, mm. right? I mean, you tell this story, and they're, they send people out. There's no evidence of a body or person there, blood or anything. And you know women, and they're hysterics. Exactly. I mean, this is the 60s. <laughs> she could have been on... Well, anything. So, um, you know, she finds the doctor, um, <laughs> Dr. John Bax or a- Saxon was his, the actor's name. Oh, I yeah. I can't remember what he, his name was in the film, but he essentially becomes a romantic interest. You know, like, oh, your aunt just said, let me have, let me give you my shoulder to cry on. And, you know, he believes her. He's the only one that believes her. Um, and she's decidedly uh, against letting this thing go so she has to go and find clues i mean because that's what you do right you search for clues about the murderer Mm -hmm. just why leave it alone (laughs) um so and her uh she's getting clues and she comes across a uh gentleman who's a reporter uh this man named landini and he was around um years past and reported on various murders but didn't want to give all the details because in his mind he assumed that giving all the details would just mean that nobody would get caught. So they want to keep some things behind, behind the scenes, which is, yeah, yeah. I guess fair play. It is sixties. I have no idea what was going on then. <laughs> um, so we come up, nobody who lived in the sixties <laughs> knew what was going on. This is true. That was the point. <laughs> Um, so it comes to the aunt's funeral. She, of course, is greeting, cus- not customers, excuse me, <laughs> mourners. Oh. Well, you know. <laughs> um, whatever, same thing. Um, and this woman, you know, her name is Lauren. She comes by and she's like, I was a friend of your aunt's and I'm so sad, you know, whatever. And I heard you were attacked and I believe you and all this stuff. Um, you know, I'm going on vacation. Do you want to just hang out in my house for a week? Well, you'll be safe there. Yeah. And of course, Nora just jumps at the chance because sure. why wouldn't you? Yeah. So the first thing she does is she gets there. It's late at night. She goes creeping right, through the drawers, mm-hmm, through mm-hmm. the the bureaus, yeah, nosy, and she finds well, what do you know? Newspaper articles that allude to the woman who was murdered in front of her eyes dun, dun, dun. as being the sister of Lauren. What? Yes, and don't you think Lauren would be a little bit more cut up about it? You would think, but I'm bum. But I'm bum. Pun intended. Mm. Um. So turns out this woman who she quote saw be murdered in front of her. Um, died 10 years ago. <gasps> so Twist. twisted again. She apparently was suffering from what they call a vision. Well, uh, a I vision? A vision. You suffer from visions? <laughs> well, I mean, 
if you're married to Vision, you probably do. He doesn't have well, a digestive system. He'll never eat a meal you make. And and, and Wanda suffered plenty. Yeah, there. Yeah, Wanda. Mm. Um, so she's all like, I think I know who the killer is because it's this dude Landini, he, the reporter. You know, he called him the alphabet serial killer. And why is he called the alphabet serial killer? Because he's been killing people with the last names that start with, you know, letters of the alphabet, but in order. So there was someone with A, B, C, and now... We're coming up to the third. And of course, I mentioned mm. her name is Nora Davis. Ah. So she's like this blonde bombshell. She knows about this. And like, she's obviously going to be the next victim, right? Well, Landini uh, apparently has unalived himself. So he can't be the killer, oh. right? Dun, dun, dun. What's going on? So she looks for more clues. Can't find anything. Someone does get murderized, but it's not Nora. Mm. But you can tell throughout the the way it happened in the scenario, it probably was meant to be her, but she narrowly escaped heads back to that woman, Lauren's house. And she's like, I'm just going to go into the dark, creepy room with the fireplace and just relax by the fire. Sure. Right. Yeah. All of a sudden a man gets up and he walks up really, really, really slowly. And you, you think that he's going to come and attack her and grab her, but he just falls down. And oh. why? Because he's got a knife stuck in his back. Wow. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's more contagious than COVID. Right. And, but it was the bearded guy. <laughs> so he can't be the killer. But who is the killer? Hmm. Dun, dun, dun. Who steps away from the person and then runs back to take the knife out of the back? His wife, Lauren. He was the husband who was moving the body for her so she wouldn't get caught. Um, but she murderized him because she didn't trust him and thought he was going to tell on her. Oh. So now it's like, uh-oh, here's Nora and here's the killer. What do we do? Well, the doctor's not in play because he's off doing something doctory. Mm. Well, it just comes down to a scuffle, really. But uh, what ends up happening is Lauren is murderized, too. She's unalived. Wow. Yeah, somehow. I won't spoil it for you. Um, and then Nora decides to escape back to America, because apparently she's American, mm. <laughs> with a name like Nora Davis, with the doctor in tow. Oh. It's a happily ever after. Huh. It, yeah, it's bizarre. Now, what I that's the basic plot. But what I really love about this is that it was um, it didn't have a very um, recognizable plot in the beginning. Like, I thought I figured it out, and then I did it. And I was pleasantly surprised because... You know, with it being an older movie, I f in my mind, I figured, well, they're not as clever as today's directors, mm -hmm. right? But I tell you, I was, I was like, pleasantly surprised at the end to find out um, how the whole thing went. And I really, I really loved it from the get-go, from when I first saw the American poster, which, by the way, radically different. It, um, it has, a, a, like, an old-school monster vibe, like, an, like a... Hmm. Like an Osferatu vibe, yeah. you know, Dracula vibe. Um, whereas the Italian one really leans more towards the, the she's a blonde bombshell, right? So she's, it, it's not like that at all. And I will tell you, the American version, bits and pieces I've seen of it, do seem to lessen the horror factor and move it into more of like the drama side of mm. it. And I think that was really to make it more applicable for audiences. Because right. of course, our rating system was not global at that point. At least I don't think it was in the 60s. And so, you know, foreign films could sometimes be really brutal and really gory. But the American audience was like, no, I can't do that. It's too much. And mm. then, of course, you know, 10 years later, here comes Jaws. But whatevs. Mm. <laughs> That's for next episode. Mm. Um, okay, so this movie's great. It's a slash movie, obviously. It deals with knives and people getting stabbed in the back, literally. Mm, yeah. Now, what's great about this, too, is that it is currently available on AMC for free to stream. Oh, nice. Yes, love that. It's also on DirecTV and my favorite horror app, the Shutter app. Oh, I love it. Yeah, so good. And it, oh, believe me, we're not the only ones gearing up for Halloween because every one of these has got mm -hmm. their Halloween repertoire coming out. Oh, yeah. Um, but these are this is available to stream. Currently, right now, it holds a 7.0 out of 10 on IMDb and a 71 respectable from Rotten Tomatoes. So mm. this movie has got narrative storytelling, even with the subtitles, right? Or, you know, basically. Um, and it is all in black and white. So as you know, as our listeners know, I love black and white films because they're creepier. Mm. And it fits the, the genre yeah. of the slasher. Very nice. Very nice. So, and it has John Saxon. John Saxon, Who, yeah. If you don't know the name, he was the dad in both the first and third Nightmare on Elm Street movies. 
makes sense. So, yes. Because I feel like once, you know, you commit to being in a horror film, you just kind of typecast. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are genre actors who look at Roger Corman. Yeah. I mean, you, you appear in one of them and you're like, oh, he was in that one and that one did well. Let's put him in this one. Right. At the same kind of role and see what happens. <laughs> because like you said, Hollywood wants to keep reproducing things to make money. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know? I mean, which is a good gig if you're a character actor, you know, who wants steady work. Why not? Sure. Fair. So, yeah. But yeah, check it out. Nice. My first pick. Very nice. Thank you. All right. So for myself, I'm going to go back, 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 back to those halcyon days of the 1980s. Ooh. When all you needed was an axe, a gallon of fake blood, and a dream. Yeah. To make a movie that would play in drive-ins all over America. It was an epic decade yes. for horror movies, both good and bad. Yes. My first pick, at first glance, looks like the latter. It looks like a blatant ripoff of movies like Friday the 13th and Sleepaway Camp. Mm. It's 1987's mm. Summer Camp Two. Nightmare. Oh. oh, summer camp nightmare. OK, now I said looks like, right. but this movie is no ripoff. No, no, no. Just by looking at the marketing for the movie, you could easily be fooled into thinking it's just another teen hack and slash bloodbath looking to make a buck. But you <laughs> would be wrong about that. Tell me how many low budget slasher movies are based on classic novels. Not many I know of. I mean, can't think of any. Yeah, see? So Summer Camp Nightmare was adapted from the 1961 novel by William Butler called The Butterfly Revolution. Ooh. Not the most enticing name for a horror movie, I admit. Mm -hmm. So they retitled it, did that awful title. <laughs> so It's not the greatest. It is not. No. no. Uh, it takes place, unsurprisingly, at a summer camp. Yeah, it's always the way. Uh, it's Camp North Pines. And a, a group of middle schoolers and high schoolers arrive for weeks of fun activities, you know, kayaking, archery, violent revolution, <laughs> you know, the usual. Summer camp nightmare. What started as a summer of fun? Oh, come on. Anybody can cross that thing. Oh, yeah? became a nightmarish game. I'll do it if you'll do it. In this camp, kids won't just be kids. They'll be killers. Some of us have been talking and we've decided to take over the camp. Franklin! 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 Here is the latest decree of the Supreme Revolutionary Committee. Controlled by the deadliest one of them all, a maniacal leader. Yes, sir, General Riley. A leader who gave them what they thought they wanted. Jim on, we're having a real life revolution with guns and knives and boys and girls sleeping together and everything. It's the best camp ever. Love, Peter. It's a camp where no one is in control. Ow, you're hurting me. You... <laughs> so one of the kids, uh, kind of a, a socially awkward lad. Sure. His name is Donald, uh, which... <laughs> You know, if your name is Donald, you probably are socially awkward. Just saying. Uh, and this kid would rather bury his nose in a good book than, you know, participate. And we've all, you know, we all know people like that, usually ourselves. Fair. Uh, fair. And that's, that's fine. Right. So in the beginning, the movie kind of plays out like you would expect from a coming of age movie. Mm. Uh, friendships are made. Sure. sure. Bullies are doing their bullying. Uh, the boys desperately want to go across the... To the, the girls' camp? The creaky, yeah, yeah. the creaky <laughs> rope bridge to the girls' camp, which is strictly forbidden. Now, the, the camp director, Mr. Warren, is played by veteran actor Chuck Connors, mm. uh, who, by the way, was also in one of my favorite horror films of all time, Tourist Trap. Um, <laughs> he is a very strict religious type and seems more interested in preventing fun from happening rather than actually letting them have fun. The other counselors don't, seem to care much about anything at all they're too busy doing their own stuff now when poor donald nearly drowns in the local lake he is saved not by one of the counselors who wasn't paying attention but by a counselor in training named franklin mm. 
Mm. Now, Franklin seems to be a good guy and mm. genuinely cares about his job and the campers. But he is also becoming increasingly frustrated by the behavior of the other counselors and the camp director. It's his first year then. Yeah, exactly. He, you know, <laughs> he hasn't been uh, desensitized. But the last straw for Franklin is when he discovers that Camp Director Warren may have had inappropriate contact with a younger camper. <gasps> and that's when Franklin decides to recruit Donald to help organize a takeover of the camp. What? Yes. A takeover that gets way out of control what? and people die. So he tries to do a camp coup? Camp coup. That'd have been a better title. Yeah. Uh, so it's a total like Lord of the Flies scenario kind of a thing where nice. kids take over and things do not go well. Uh, if you've ever seen the classic episode of The Simpsons where Bart and Lisa go to Camp Krusty, you get the idea. Oh, uh, Camp Krusty. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Summer Camp Nightmare is, like I said, it was based on the novel and it follows the novel, you know, in, in, in an interesting way. But it's it's more about. You know, this 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 little revolt in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. that, you, you know, it it they mean well, you know, they're they're trying to, you know, uh, get the point across that, you know, uh, the, for the abuse and the lack of supervision and all that. But mm -hmm. as I said, things go badly and the mob mentality takes over and it's just <laughs> things just get get way, way out of hand. Like and hysteria takes place? Yeah, basically. Yeah. So, uh, but it's really, really interesting. It's uh, it's actually a good movie. I liked it quite a bit, and it is absolutely not what you would expect to see right. uh, from something called Summer Camp Nightmare. <laughs> uh, so Summer Camp Nightmare was co-written by a woman named Penelope Spheris. And she actually went on to be a big director in Hollywood. Uh, she directed the uh, Wayne's World movie, oh. uh, the Beverly Hillbillies movie, okay. and is probably best known for a, a trilogy of documentaries about music called The Decline of Western Civilization, oh. uh, which are all great documentaries yeah. if, you can, if you can find them. They're fantastic. Um, but there was some solid acting. The, I mean, there is plenty of cheese to go around. It's the 80s. Um, it's the 80s. But it is certainly one of those defies expectations mm -hmm. kind of movies where you're like, oh, summer camp nightmare. Let me just pop this in. But it actually turned out to be a, a decent flick. Um, as far as the scores go, it does get kind of a meh. Fair. 5.4 out of 10. Ooh, that's a little bit tough. Yeah. Um, and a completely disrespectful 38% on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know why. But it's never actually been officially released on dvd um it was uh vhs a long time ago but if you want to see it it is available for free on youtube as we speak as yes. of this recording uh, you know it may be gone tomorrow but that's that's just how it goes that's with the nature things. of youtube i'm afraid it is but if you get the chance uh, and you're looking for something to watch that you know is kind of obscure uh but i think you know worth the time to track it down and just watch it Summer Camp Nightmare on YouTube. Check it out. Sweet. There you go. I like the idea that like it's not a traditional summer camp movie. No. Yeah. It's basically like it was providing January 6th with their inspiration. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. So there you go. Okay. Well, um, before we get to our honorable mentions, of which I've got a few, um, my second pick. Now. I also ventured into the 80s because, of course, as we all know, the 80s was the summer, was the, the generation, was the decade of the summer slasher film. That's exactly right. I mean, I feel like people were obsessed with summer slasher films to the point where, like, you know, there were versions upon versions upon versions of B versions of movies. Mm -hmm. um, which, by the way, to be honest, I look back on it and that's kind of fun because it most is. of them are just silly. They're right? silly and they always made money. <laughs> exactly this is where americans you know this is where we lost our our virtue is uh in the 80s with summer slashers but anyways mine comes from 1981 mm -hmm. and it is a camp summer camp movie as well okay. <laughs> um it is called the burning oh my god did you pick it too yes oh oh my god okay it's not a knife people it's garden shears but 
Okay. Wow. Let me let me give a bril- a brief one, and then we can both talk about it. Brief Way breakdown. To prune my pick. <laughs> oh, that's so applicable. Ugh. To be fair, folks, this almost never happens. We almost never, uh, well, we never really guess each other. That's part of the fun. Yeah. But it almost never happens where we do pick the same movie. I mean, it's, right. I mean this is probably and, like the and third. And this just proves that we don't tell each other what we've picked exactly. before we start recording. <laughs> I saw it in your eyes when I started it's talking like, about it. <laughs> I'm like, did we pick the same? Oh. This summer, if you're planning to go camping, don't. If you're looking forward to midnight swims, don't. Listen, you're going back to the campsite. Get some matches. Build us a hot fire. And if you're thinking about being with someone where no one can see you, don't. Because this summer, a legend of terror isn't just a campfire story anymore. They say he smashed his way through the bunk room door, just a mass of flames. I cried out, I will return, I will have my revenge. He lives on whatever he can catch right now. One summer five years ago is about to happen again and again and again. The burning. This is about a movie um, about teenagers. They come to camp and um, it's one of those um, movies, too, where you get to see flashbacks and flash forwards of the story. Mm -hmm. But essentially, these kids are kind of they're just jerks. They're mean to the (laughs) to the camp uh, groundskeeper who was named Cropsy. What a weird name. Oh, I've got good information on that. It sounds like a weird 1920s disease. And I'll tell you why when you're done. (laughs) Because I got some good info on that. Because that's a real person. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah. Um. So they decide. Well, you know what? What's the best thing to do at summer camp? We're gonna become legends, and we're gonna prank Cropsy. So let's take this. I think it was a fake animal skull, and put some worms in it, <laughs> and like put it on his bed. That'll do have, it. Watch him freak out from the outside. Mm. Except, yeah, he did. But then it led to a cabin fire, and he got super burned up. And in order to, you know, not perish, he just in one of the most fabulous and iconic scenes runs into the lake to douse himself yeah. um but he Propsy got crispy yeah he doesn't drown though he does not yeah. drown he survived and now those kids having known nothing else about it just went on with their lives sure they, they know probably, what you did last summer <laughs> they probably went on to have their own nasty jerkish kids mm-hmm. um but five years later cropsy is released from the hospital and he, you can imagine he's a little upset, right? Yeah, I would think so. He's got you know, issues. They they tried very hard to give him some cool skin grafts to make him look, mm. you know, human. Kind of. But it didn't work, no. you know? And so now he's forced to basically go around trench coating it everywhere. Yeah, this because, is before they invented the face-off technology that did. Uh, yeah. If he had only known John Travolta. If only we if all only, did. If only, yeah. Would. <laughs> Fair. Um, so guess what? He's angry. Yep. And he wants yep. the yep. whole revenge, the revenge for the kids who mm-hmm. just everything. He took away his life, took away his face, took away everything. So he happens to find some garden shears. It's the garden shears that get it for me because I'm like, they're at a summer camp. Couldn't you use an axe or a hatchet or a bow s- yeah. shears? I mean, and and see, here's the thing. They should have named it the pruning because <laughs> it's garden shears. And I mean, it seems like a natural. That's the thing. And it's called The Burning, right? Which doesn't necessarily indicate that it's going to be a summer camp movie. No. But of course that. Another pertains. terrible title. Yeah. It just doesn't do much for it. So anyways. Um, oh, how about Sheer Madness? Shoo. I go. saw a play called Sheer Madness. I've heard of that. Yeah. It was actually quite funny. Hmm. Um, what happens next? Well, basically he goes on a, on a rampage mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he corners all of these kids, excuse me, in different scenarios. So like, you know, the kids are like doing their thing in the forest and then one goes to go find firewood and she goes in the forest to find her clothes that are, you know, missing, but for some reason, and she gets a shears to the chest and, Mm. you know, other kids are getting all bloodied with their canoes and just being chased. They're being hunted. Cropsy is hunting them. Mm. And, 
you know, what's really scary is that <laughs> these kids keep discovering the bodies of their friends. Like, it's not like it, you know, oh, where is so-and-so? And you are led to assume that they're, they've they been perished. Oh, no, no, no. It's gory. They find these bodies in the forest. Yeah. <laughs> there's some, there's some actually some good gore in this movie. Yes. The, I would honestly argue this is one of the films that, like, they did gore right. And they didn't put, put blood in just to, to paint, wash it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, my gosh. Um, so <laughs> we're down to, like, out of the friend group that was there, we're probably down to, like, two guys. I think maybe, I don't know if Michelle is still alive, but she was one of them. Um, and, you know, eventually Cropsey does cut, meet his end. But what I love about it is at the end, they're showing um, another bunch of kids at camp telling the quote legend mm. of Cropsey. And what's hilarious is that I remember being a kid and telling the legends of black Mary and, mm. or, you know what I mean? Like bloody Mary and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, so anyways, yeah, it, it's a classic eighties slasher film legitimately. And you could say it slices mm. the box charts a little bit. Yep. Um, it didn't come in at the best with ratings. We got a no. 6.1 out of 10 on IMDb. That's not terrible. It's not. But what I will say is that AMC is doing a great job of bringing back these films right mm -hmm. now. Because, again, it's available on streaming. It's also available on Hoopla and Shudder. Uh, man, Shudder's got so many cool things. It's, it's wonderful. And you really, really, really benefit because, you know, you don't have to pay for a subscription. I mean, you could. But you can get a free subscription. And they have so many free things. Mm -hmm. And their ads are unlike other things actually pertain to the genre yeah. like for horror movies yeah um but yeah so good movie i encourage yeah. you to check it mm -hmm. out and i also want to know what cropsy means okay so but first of all i want to call out some of the uh, actors that were in this movie that became famous later on yes holly hunter i know the name yes yeah. she was from raising arizona and oh. a bunch of other things jason alexander from seinfeld yes yes and then fisher stevens from short circuit <laughs> which was i mean amazing the, i love that movie so uh and another name that is tied to this movie that is uh, a little more infamous uh and that is the actual idea for the burning for the movie itself came from a guy called schmarmy schmarstein uh yeah Har Har uh, harvey <laughs> Weinstein. yeah we don't talk about that we movie. don't talk about him no. but yes that's that is exactly true but let's get to the good stuff yeah uh, the film is kind of based on an urban legend Ooh. Uh, the urban legend of the Staten Island Boogeyman, <laughs> also known as Cropsy. Oh. Yes. Supposedly an escaped mental patient oh, with a hook for an arm and a penchant for kidnapping children, Cropsy was meant to be a spooky story to scare kids into behaving themselves uh, and not straying too far from home. But nice. here's the thing. Uh, there was a real Cropsy. Oh. His name was Andre Rand. He was believed to have kidnapped and killed at least five children in the Staten Island area between 1972 and 1987. Wow. Yeah. There is a great documentary on it called Cropsy, which you can find uh, streaming. I highly recommend it. Uh, now, in case you were wondering, Andre Rand is currently in prison. Oh, he's alive. Yes, and will be eligible for parole when he is 93 years old. And how old is he now? Uh, I have no idea how old he is now, but... 92 and a half? Yeah, probably <laughs> something... Oh, God. ...like that. I don't know. Oh, we don't live in anywhere he'll near be, He'll probably get out the same time that Harvey Weinstein does. Uh, how uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, now, another interesting fact about the burning... Is that you said, you know, you were talking, we were talking about the gore. Yeah. Right. Uh, that in order for the film to get an R rating, they had to actually cut a lot of the gore out. What? Yes. In fact, the R rated version of The Burning was the only one that existed until 30 years later when an uncut version with the gore restored was released. And that's Ooh. the one you saw, I believe. Uh, and. You know, that's uh, I, I always love it when when stuff like that happens, when they discover, uh, oh. oh, there's this footage that we had that was cut and we didn't we didn't know it still existed. And we found it and we put it back in. And so the the one I the, the way you're describing it, the one I saw was the unrated version. And I think that's probably what yeah. you saw, too. I guess so. But they had to. Wow. So-called cut it up <laughs> uh, to be able to release it in, the to up. theaters. I know. So that's actually kind of crazy. So. By today's standards, I can't really say that it's like 
you know, an insane amount. But thinking back on it, I can't imagine ever watching a movie that had that much gore in it. Mm. So, wow. I Yeah, wow. Yeah. They took out a lot then in order they to- They had it- to. So what would it have been then? Like an NC-17 maybe? Back then it would have been an X, which oh. was death for a film because at the time the X rating was associated with pornography. Right, right. And if you gave- uh, if you if you got an X rating for your film, first of all, theaters wouldn't book it. Newspapers, magazines would not run ads for it. Television wouldn't run ads for it. Right. And you were screwed. So um, sometimes they had to release films that were unrated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, you know, that would some sometimes skirt around that problem. But most of the time they would have to take stuff out in order for it to get an right. R you know, and that's a whole other which crazy even process. an R rating is like big deal. It can be. Big, I mean, I'm talking like 80s. Yeah. Type. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's one reason, uh, you know, there were one reason why they actually added in the 80s the uh, PG-13 rating mm-hmm. uh, because there was this too big a gap between PG and R. Yeah. And they had to have something, you know, in between because, you know. Uh, PG, you know, PG was getting away with a lot more over time. Right. Uh, and they had to say, wait, 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 wait. No, we have to add PG-13 because, and then they added NC-17, which went away pretty quickly because <laughs> it ran into the same problem as the x rating. Right, right. So what are you going to do? Yeah. So, but, oh, I just checked uh, that Cropsy documentary. Yeah. Is on Prime Video. Oh, nice. And pretty much every other streaming service. <laughs> so if, you know, if you got any movie streaming service, Cropsy is probably on it and you should watch it because it's fascinating. Tis the season. Tis the season. There you go. Season. Now, do you have honorable mentions? I absolutely do. I'm going to pull them up right now. Um, One thing that I think is kind of hilarious about us both picking the, the exact same pick is that, like I said, we don't mention it. We don't Mm-mm. talk about nope. it or anything like this. But it's also... It was my attempt to trick you because it's called The Burning, right? And I didn't think that it would be obvious that it would be a, quote, summer slasher film, like a Michael Myers film, you know? So. I'm sorry, are you talking to me? Well. You should, I mean, you should know better of all people. I just try. I mean, I've never really accomplished it, but it was, it's always a dream of mine to like out, out movie you, let's mm, say it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have tried that. It has remained a dream, and it will probably remain a dream mm. for the rest of my life. I think so. Uh, but, uh, yeah, okay, so honorable mentions. Um, our friend Bill of the show, Bill's a nice, uh, a long-time listener, and by long time, probably just like a few episodes. But mm. either way, sent in uh, a couple of suggestions, um, which I will now read out. Um, one of them was an episode from uh, or from Creep Show 2, a, a segment entitled The Raft. Oh, yes. It follows a group of young adults who swim out to and become stranded on the eponymous raft <laughs> Oh, oh god so of flesh dissolving <laughs> oil slick looking blob yeah, monster yeah and apparently it, it includes some classic tom savini uh skin melting uh fx my man it just my man tom but, savini but it's just it's one of those things and um then of course um sleepaway camp was was there but i yep. also i also watched one called it's my birthday and it's about like these weird cheerleader things and it's just it goes wrong quickly and most of these movies are going to be really silly but yeah, you would course. do yourself a favor to watch them mm-hmm. um and then the last one would be bloody mary i mentioned uh, it earlier yep, it yep. is a camp movie um about kids who believe in bloody mm-hmm. mary cool yeah so uh i would go with and this is kind of a i don't know if this really fits in but for me i think it does midsummer Oh, okay. Crazy, weird horror film. Is, so the, is that the Midsummer S O M? Yes, S O M M A R. Midsummer. I, yes. Um, uh, Cabin Fever. Oh, okay. Fair. Which is gross. Yeah. Uh, um, Sleepaway Camp was also one of mine. Placid Lake. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Tourist Trap, which I mentioned earlier, which is a crazy movie. Uh, and Blood Beach, which I believe I've mentioned yes, before, which yes. is, you know, uh, with the greatest tagline of any movie ever. <laughs> Just when you thought. It was safe to go back in the water. You can't get to it. <laughs> it's, it's it's hilarious, but also like it. it draws you in. Yeah, it does I love its it. job. Fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely love it. Oh, All right, man, that what was a good cool. episode. That was huh? cool, and it's just getting started. It's part one now. Part we mentioned one. that we it's a two part series yes. here. Um, part two will be like we said, movies that deal with like the ocean, the beach, and you know things like that. Jaws ripoffs, if we have any, or yes. Jaws. Flinoffs, finoffs, finoffs, yes, finoffs. Yeah, yeah. Almost went flan there. Which, by oh. the way, a previous uh, a previous episode of the microcast, 
actually dealt with Jaws ripoff. So yes. if you want to prepare, go back and check that out. And where Absolutely. can we do, where can people do that? Well, they can do that and they can get a feel of our horror month spectacular. If they head to our website, thedivepodcast.com, where you will find a um the entire repertoire basically minus episode one of our podcast you can listen to any of them anytime download them stream them it's lovely we've got a merch stand there you can get some of our cool t-shirts and we also typically have a yearly or seasonal t-shirt um i still wear my halloween one from 2020 or whatever 2019 maybe i can't remember we've been doing this for a million years Mm -hmm. um but we're also going to have a really cool new design coming up i think you said from your daughter katie yes yes, she's going to be designing uh designing the character we're going to use for this year's shirt that's awesome so you got to get yourself a t-shirt it's soft comfortable they're really cheap we don't make much money if anything on them but really it helps us get the word out yeah so you'll find links to our social medias there instagram facebook twitter we're pretty active there um and our if you want to send us a suggestion much like bill did you can email us at the deep dive podcast at gmail.com please do Please do. And stay tuned, like I said, for part two, because I came up with the splasher part of this. That's right. The splashers. um, I got to be honest. I am so excited to give you these really amazing movies. So stay tuned listening. In between, you can always listen to the Deep Dive microcast, like Mm -hmm. you said, because, Mm -hmm. of course, they're very short. They give you a little feel of what we do here. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Right? Absolutely. Thank you to everybody who has downloaded our episodes and who's listened to us and continues to listen. And, and in my case, just continues and continues mm. and continues mm. and eventually continues mm. to listen to everything mm-hmm. that we have mm-hmm. to say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to just go ahead and stop now. All right, then. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. So, you know, we have this amazing podcast. And as, as Amanda said, we have the Deep Dive Microcast. Yes. We also have Mysteries of the Deep. And we have uh, the newer one, Pilot Error, which talks about uh, TV show pilots that didn't quite make it. Uh, that's always a fun thing. So we want, as Amanda has said, to thank you for listening. Yes. Uh, for Manda, I'm Tom Feeney. Don't forget to tell your friends, tell your enemies. Tell, tell your pets. Your, tell your hairdresser. Yep. So you have something to talk about because that's awkward. Yep. Uh, and we... We'll catch you next time. We'll slice you later. Hey, uh, what? I don't. We'll, we'll what? cut you up later. Um, no. We'll dice you. Um, no. Anyways, see you later. Bye. bye. All clips used in the Deep Dive podcast are meant for educational purposes only and not to infringe on existing copyrights. The Deep Dive theme was composed and performed by Ryan Blaney and produced by EchoCraft. The Deep Dive Podcast is a production of Automaton Studios.